Thank you very much. Hello, and thank you for joining our panel on how to develop privacy controls that minimize risk. We have an impressive set of panelists from industry and academia to discuss this topic today. Our format will begin with introductions and move to a brief presentation from each of our panelists, followed by question and answer. I'm Chris Shanafield, Principal Engineer at Cisco Systems, focused on security analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence requirements, and innovation for Cisco products. To start with the panelists, we have Professor Masuda Bashir, an associate professor at the School of Information Science and Director of Social Sciences and Engineering Research at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Bashir's research interests are at the interface of information technology, human psychology, and society, especially how it privacy affects privacy, security, and trust from a psychological point of view with information systems. Dr. Bashir's interdisciplinary educational background, industry experience, research accomplishments and leadership roles in directing several educational and research programs provides her the broader and human-centered perspective that is at the core of her privacy and security research agenda. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Bashir. Thank you. We had next up is Lisa Bobbitt, uh, the alphabet soup of certifications for Lisa, CISSP, C CIPM, CIPPE, and CDPSE. She is the lead privacy engineering architect in Cisco's privacy office. Lisa is passionate about embedding privacy awareness, governance, and technology across Cisco by building in the foundations of years of work in beginning with mainframe connectivity, mobile routing platforms and protocols, innovative concepts in 3D, voice video data and event management, government adaptation of our commercial offers, embedded trust anchors, and now privacy. She believes everyone as a digital citizen should be a private advocate by first understanding the value of authorized use of our personal and viable information and then applying controls to de-risk the potential harm to themselves and others. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. Thank you. Next, we have Guy Cohen. As head of policy, Guy is responsible for Privatar's work relating to data protection regulations, data privacy standards, and data ethics. Guy was a member of the Royal Society Privacy Enhancing Technology Working Group and is the technical editor of the IEEE Data Privacy Process Standards. Guy was a fellow at Cambridge University Center of Science and Policy and his prior work before joining Privatar, he worked in the UK Civil Service, working in the Department of Health, the Cabinet Office and HMRC. Guy holds a bachelor's BSc in Physics and Philosophy from the University of Bristol. Welcome, Guy. And next we have Zio Z Kin, an associate chief executive, executive of Data Innovation and Protection Group of the Infocom Media Development Authority of Singapore, IMDA, and deputy commissioner of the Personal Data Protection Commission, PDPC. In his capacity as assistant chief executive, Z Kim oversees IMDA's artificial intelligence and the industry development strategy. This is one of four frontier technology areas for the IMDA which covered digital economy. The other three are cybersecurity, Internet of Things, and immersive media. In his role as an AI and data analytics champion, Zin's work includes developing forward-thinking governance on AI and data, driving a pipeline of AI talent, promoting industry adoption of artificial intelligence and data analytics, as well as building a specific AI and data science capabilities in Singapore. As a deputy chief commissioner, deputy commissioner of Personal Data Protection Commission, Zekins oversees the administration and enforcement of the Personal Data Protection Act of 2012. His key responsibilities include managing the formulation and implementation of policies relating to protection of personal data, as well as the issuing of enforcement direction for organizational actions. He also spearheads the public and, and private sector educational and outreach activities to, re, to raise both awareness and compliance in organizations and individuals in personal data protection. Thank you for joining us today, Zikin. Now, without further ado, let's begin the moderator panel, the, the panel presentations. We'll begin with Professor Bashir. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, my slide starts with the development of comprehensive criteria for privacy protections framework. I'm hoping that Samuel has those slides ready to go. Okay, um, as Chris um, uh, kindly presented, um, my name is Masuda Bashir. 
I'm an associate professor in the School of Information Sciences in the University of Illinois. And it's really a great pleasure to be with this, such a distinguished panel here today uh, to present on my research related to privacy protections and the framework that we'd like to propose uh, as something that should be considered by the privacy community um, to move forward. Um, let me, I'm hoping that worked and I'm in the second slide. Uh, so um, thank you, that, that's great. So um, to this group, I don't have to preach so much, but all of you understand, and we all know that cloud computing is really one of the major evolutions of computer technology and it's made a world of difference as far as uh, availability, access to information. Um, however, with all of these capability comes new threats to security and privacy. And while security controls and cloud computing have gained a lot of attention and detail in protections, uh, privacy protections in the cloud have not uh, unfortunately been um, studied as well or have been protected as well. Um, third slide. Um, so the motivation for our research uh, was, of course, that, um, um, again, we wanted to really develop um, this type of uh, comprehensive or systematic approach specifically divine, uh, designed for privacy protections and cloud computing environments. Um, so our, our research goal was to build a comprehensive set of privacy protections. I'm on slide three, sorry. Um, so our research goal was to build a comprehensive set of privacy protection criteria that can serve as baseline privacy protections and controls eventually. We coined this uh, new framework to be called um, C squared, P squared, Comprehensive Criteria Pri Pri Privacy Protection Framework. And our hope for this, our um, design for this framework was to serve as baseline protection that can be further developed to come up with baseline standards and as well as controls. It's also to provide an evaluation criterion for analyzing privacy protection measures, newly formed frameworks or certifications for the cloud. Um, our, uh, we conducted a scientific and systematic uh, approach to our research. Um, it was a very tedious and cumbersome and detailed work that my graduate students uh, were able to do. So I thank them for all the good work they've done. But we were able to really look at um, very, with a fine tooth comb, uh, several frameworks that have already been developed to understand what are the commonalities and what were the differences. And um, as you can see in this timeline, we are still in the midst of developing this fully and verifying it by quantitative methods, but we're done with the first uh, set of criteria, which was mostly done through qualitative analysis. And we're glad to say that we have a really good um, set of uh, criteria that we've uh, identified. Our evaluation uh, included 10 previously developed frameworks, including FIPS, GDPR, the first version of NIST, CSA, CCM, CCPA, APAC, Australia's Privacy Act, South Asia Specific Data Protection, NIST 800, and the FTC um, uh, frameworks that were available publicly to us so that we could um, um, analyze them. Um, some of the sources, um, uh, ha uh, all of the sources had some information around privacy protections. A uh, majority of them were indirect or implied privacy protections, so we had to be very careful about what we selected and didn't select. Uh, however, uh, some of the other frameworks were mostly focused on security, so we had to, again, be very careful in our analysis and evaluation of these. As you can see, uh, we developed uh, our, our own criteria, which we again refer to as C squared, P squared, which includes 107 privacy criteria. The majority of these criteria obviously come from existing frameworks and standards. Now you may ask why we considered standards and frameworks and uh, other types of things that may not necessarily have the same kinds of information, but as you all know, privacy protections are very, um, you know, very uh, elementary at this point and we need to develop this further. So we wanted to include, uh, be inclusive, include it in as many different sources that we could. And as you can see, there's a lot of different types of criteria that come from different sources. Um, so what is, uh, the, during the development of C squared, P squared framework, we learned that, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities that exist among the different sources of privacy. 
Um, e even though we continue to see new frameworks being developed and uh, announced by different regions in the world, when you actually put them all next to each other and you look at them, there's a lot of similarities, there's a lot of overlap, and there's a lot of good work that has already been that can be um, established as, as a hopefully as a baseline set of protections. Um, we also found that privacy protection in these frameworks are often indirect or implied in uh, other broader aspects of the framework, uh, not necessarily recognized as privacy protection. We also learned that um, the, a lot of the criteria in C squared, P squared were originally referred to security protection, but they also provide privacy protection. So things like encryption, um, um, you know, uh, protections of PII and things like that were uh, what we identified to be also privacy protections in addition to security. Um, in addition, we learned that uh, in contrast to security, privacy has not been equally studied and examined. So there's still a lot of work to be done, a lot of research and a lot of work from the privacy community to come up with a comprehensive list of criteria that we can all use as baseline criteria that can be then eventually moved into controls and standards, hopefully. Um, so therefore, uh, we hope that this C squared, P squared framework that we are proposing can be um, uh, evaluated, uh, criticized and critiqued um, by as many privacy experts as we can get so that we can improve this further and provide it as a standard in the coming years. Um, I also want to end my presentation uh, with um, you know, acknowledging um, Cisco Corporation for funding this research and for collaborating with us on this project, uh, bringing on a real world uh, industry experience into our um, process of research and discovery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bashir. It's a pleasure to work with you. Now let's move yeah. from Dr. Bashir. We'll, we'll move directly to the next presenter and we'll take questions and answers at the end of the session. So without further ado, Lisa Bobbitt, would you like to start your presentation? Yes, please. Hi, my name is Lisa Bobbitt. I am the privacy uh, architect at Cisco. And um, with, within our environment, we spend a lot of time trying to determine exactly what should be built into our products, built around our products as processes, and so have and so that we can meet the certifications and have the ability to go to market everywhere in the world. So um, let's go to my first chart, please. So with what we do at Cisco is we take the concept of privacy by design and we actually build it at, from the very beginning into our privacy policy. And so the work that, that this team has done with C2P2 allows us to actually look at getting a normalization of the industry standards. And that allows us then to know that when we go to look at these things at the end of our cycle, which we'll walk through, um, we can actually go into and be pretty close to what we need to have available to us to go into certifications in the long run. So the ability to get to normal, normalized terminology and taxonomy, as well as the ability to see exactly where things are the same or where there are differences become really important to us. Of course, that's just one piece of what we put into our policy because we do have other things that are specific to our company, to the markets we're after, as well as to what how we are um, as the processor for many of our customers uh, uh, have to handle their contractual requirements. Let's go to the next chart. So when we look at privacy engineering, it's really a fairly simple six step process. We have to understand what we're going to have to do in the market so we just need to understand what our, the company that we're working at, in our case, Cisco, is trying to bring to market. Then we take that policy that I just talked about and understand exactly which requirements we have to handle to go through this, uh, this environment. So in that sense, so again, having the C2P2 baseline of having fairly common statements, we can actually break those requirements into three things. We can handle processes and procedures, that we need to wrap around our um, offerings. We need to have the mechanisms, and Guy will talk a lot about more about some of, some of the mechanisms that are available to us, but 
building those into the product, into the technology. And then we have to keep that awareness for all the people who are touching the data of what they should be doing with personal data. So we have to keep that awareness and that training in place. All of that, of course, then goes around and, and you can see my chart certainly my air is a little crazy, but my quality assurance always has to come back, feed back into the process. And it's an ongoing agile loop for us to always know that we are trying to do the very best to de-risk our products and meet the requirements so that we can go to market with privacy awareness. Next chart. So when you look at it specific to what we do at Cisco, we walk through the planning, development, validate, launch, operate, monitor, because as a processor of a customer's data, we have to be constantly looking at this. And we have very specific things that once we've got those requirements, we can take those controls, scope the data that we're working with, do our, our assessments, and then build in the requirements that we need to do, walk through with our user stories as part of the engineering uh, baseline, and then look at the threats, look at the risk, the vulnerabilities, and then determine which of those, what, what will meet the requirements for those controls that we saw in that, in that space. With that assessment, it continues to go through. We update it as we start validating and realizing that maybe data has changed and therefore we have to verify that the controls have changed and that they're still meeting that, the, the baseline we're looking for. And then what we believe is that you have to be transparent about what you're doing. So we build out what we call a data sheet and a data map to show both what we're doing with the data that's personal as well as where it is flowing and who has um, access to it, as well as how we clean up after the fact. Then as we go through that launch, we actually start looking at it for moder uh, for operational reasons. And then we also look at it to make sure that we are continuing to meet those policies and the privacy controls. So in that life cycle, which is always continuous and always agile, we can constantly look at that for our cloud baseline. The next statement, next chart, please. And what that really ends up doing is letting us be transparent for the regulations. We can then know that the data that we're presenting is up to date. It, we know where the risks are and we can be very clear about them that maybe there needs to be a new process wrapped around it because we didn't build in a mechanism or we, we, and we can define that process so people know clearly what they can do in this space. And then of course, like I said, you can see real quick from a one pager to say, oh, I know where my data is. I know who's touching it. I know what we're doing with it because it's the function of the offer. I can see where it's running in the, in, um, the world. I can actually know who's touching it from the different uh, icons and get a snapshot of that, which of course then the data sheet behind it has more details. So that's how our privacy engineering environment actually could take advantage of using the C2P2 is that with that baseline of consistent normalized information, we would then be prepared to be able to go and find privacy mechanisms and then in turn get to the regulations and be able to be able to um, operate around the world. So thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Very good, thank you. And um, so the next uh, presenter will be Guy Cohen. Please, Guy. Uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm Guy Cohen. I'm the head of policy at Privatar, uh, a privacy engineering enterprise software company. Um, so uh, Samuel, please could you put up my deck and go to the first slide. So I'm going to be talking today a little bit about the relationship between regulations and controls and, and the gap between them. So, um, as many of you will be aware, in the last few years, uh, next slide, please. Um, um, in the uh, recent years, we have seen a large number of new laws come through, and we expect to see many more in the coming years. So, obviously, the GDPR and the CCPA have taken on the LGPD, have taken up a lot of attention, but with India and China with uh, having proposed bills as well, we expect to see this increase with more people living in jurisdictions that have comprehensive privacy or data protection laws. Um, uh, uh, next animation, please. At the same time, we've seen a range of new technologies come through, uh, which offer new privacy functionality, um, or perhaps they're, they're old technologies, but have been repurposed 
to uh, allow us some way of mitigating and managing privacy risk. And the key thing here is that these two things are not equal, right? So the, the, uh, the wording of the regulations is not the same as the wording of the controls. The nature of these requirements doesn't, doesn't match the functional property of some of these controls. So you could think about this a bit like someone saying, look, I need to, I need to build a much more robust car. And an engineer saying, great, I, I, I've come up with a new way to make very lightweight, strong steel. That's sort of, okay, well, that's useful. That, that might be how I, how I can achieve my goal, but it's not in and of itself what I need. Uh, I might need to add that into other things in a process. And, and maybe I need steel, but, but maybe I'd be using aluminium for my specific uh, car model instead. I need to, need to think about that. So it's useful tools, but they're not, they're not direct maps to the, the privacy requirements we're seeing in the laws. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, what are these requirements and controls? Well, I mean things from the regulatory side, like data protection impact assessments, legitimate interest assessments, data protection by design default, data minimization, anonymization, all things which require data controllers to evaluate privacy risk, to consider the risk posed to an individual, um, and then demonstrably mitigate and manage that risk. Um, and uh, next action, please. Uh, and on the privacy control side, I mean a, a wide range of things from something like obfuscation, by which I mean things like data masking, replacing a direct identifier like a name, a, a pseudonym or a token like a regular expression, uh, or, or blurring data, maybe changing a date of birth to a month, um, uh, through to things like differential privacy, which isn't really a technology, more, more definition, but can uh, differentiate private mechanisms, can enable us to um, have uh, strong resilience to even unknown attacks when we publish data. Uh, data watermarking, which because when we're doing things like obfuscating, where we, we're altering the data a little bit, we can alter it with a small signal put in. And that allows us to then track data and uh, attach policies to it. So we might say, well, this data was provisioned to Guy Cohen to use this environment. It's popped up online over here. What did you do, Guy? How, how did that end up there? So we can layer things on on top of that. Um, synthetic data, which isn't real data. Sorry, just back to the previous slide, please. Um, which isn't real data, but is... Uh, uh, made to look like data, which can help us understand some of the properties of data without having the same risk of sharing real data. And then secure environments, which obviously have been around for a while, but we're getting new abilities to uh, um, uh, to use them, new techniques, especially in the cloud, and, and renewed interest in them. And you can see those things all offer a very different concept of privacy. They're not all doing the same thing, and they're not all doing the kind of general sense of data minimization. I mean, in a way they all are, but they're not precisely delivering on a requirement. They're offering a specific kind of privacy risk mitigation or management. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so I think when thinking about these controls, it's important to consider a couple of points. One is that no privacy control in and of itself delivers compliance, right? You don't, using differential privacy doesn't mean everything you're doing is compliant, uh, nor does, is that true of obfuscation. Um, rather, you need to apply these in context as part of a holistic process. So it's the controls as part of a process with reasoning around them. Uh, and I think the work that, that, that um, Suda's been doing and, and, and others, um, uh, and other standards as well, uh, can help us understand what those uh, processes look like, what the flow is, what the stages are, and where these controls fit in. Um, and then, uh, next point, please. Uh, and I think case studies can help us understand these processes and the reasoning that was involved with the specific configuring of controls. Because again, just using a control like say differential privacy or synthetic data, uh, there are lots of different ways to implement it. There's lots of decisions that are made about well actually how much noise are you gonna add or in what way are you gonna create synthetic data and how are you gonna make sure that it's safe and doesn't, doesn't reconstruct some of the data from the original data set. So those kinds of uh, reasonings um, uh, are very dependent on specific situations and they vary for example from one industry to another um, you know if you're dealing with location data that's very different to demographic data in terms of the risks that are presented but also the kind of controls you can use um, so we think case studies are important case studies are important for helping establish process helping establish the placement of controls um, in that process and the reasoning around them and that that can feed in and support um, uh, uh, standards. So there's a project we've been doing for the last uh, nearly 18 months now in the UK where we've been working with organisations involved with uh, health research and we've been looking at their processes, uh, looking at, at the flow of data. And I'm just going to share some, some thoughts based on, on, on some high level things. Obviously there's a, there's a lot more detail than what I'm going to go through in the next few minutes but, but generally you can imagine a process for sharing data where you onboard the data you know, from whatever the source is, whether it's collecting from patients or from other, other data controllers, 
And then maybe you, you share some information about that data with those who want to use it, maybe health researchers. You say, you know, at the most basic level, you say, I have this data. Maybe you show them the schema or, or something more. And then maybe they request the data and there's a process there. Um, and then you give them access to that data. Uh, and maybe there's conditions on which it's given. And then finally, there's a data release. So, so health researchers, maybe they, they're accessing the data for doing their research, but then they want to publish that data, or perhaps they're working on a new diagnostic tool and there's a model they want to share. So one needs to consider that stage as well. And you can see different technologies, different controls fit in at different places in this process. So obfuscation, uh, when you onboard the data, maybe you want to mask some of the direct identifiers or say, well, we don't really need to know the address of these patients. Why don't we drop that and just keep the zip code or postcode? Uh, and then with data previews, you might say, well, we don't, we don't want to show people the raw data because that's far too uh, uh, high privacy risk, but maybe we'll show them synthetic data so they can have a sense of what's there uh, and formulate their, their queries or their models before requesting the data itself. So they know roughly what we have, uh, but we're not, we're not necessarily putting the same risk in place uh, or taking the same risk. And then for a data request, maybe then you can fit further obfuscations to the specifics of the request and say, well, for this bit of research, you actually don't need to know their, their date of birth at all. You just need to know their age. So we can blur that a bit. Or maybe you don't need to know zip code, we can blur this to, to just town. Uh, and then at data access, when you provision data to someone, maybe you say, well, we're not going to give it just a copy of you for your home computer. We're going to provide this into a secure cloud environment. And there are going to be restrictions on, on what, what can be done in that, what programs can be executed, and, and what data put into that, again, so that we can make sure that if, if data does go, go missing, we have a way of, of figuring out where it's from. And then finally, when uh, one of the things people often misunderstand is that actually aggregates and, and machine learning models can leak the training data they, they were trained on or the, the data the aggregates were extracted from. And so maybe you'd use differential privacy there to protect aggregate statistics from the health research or, or the models that are being used to protect those from uh, people attacking them and reconstructing some of the original data. And so you can see the controls fit in at different places in this process. Um, and next animation, please. Um, and at the same time, when you're going through this process, a lot of the reasoning about using these tools can uh, be mapped back to those requirements. And we're saying, oh, we obfuscate data, doesn't necessarily demonstrate you've met data minimization. When you explain, well, look, at the point of onboarding, we consider these to be the risks. And so we applied these controls at this stage. And then later on at the data request, we applied further obfuscation. That can combination gives a stronger story as to why you consistently applied principles like data privacy by design default and, and data minimization throughout that process. Um, and as you can see, there are different, you would gather evidence on your regulatory um, uh, obligations at different stages because different controls and different stages of the process map perhaps more or less to some of your privacy requirements. Um, so obviously that's a very high level view of some of these things. Um, we, uh, as this part of a, a research project I mentioned that we'll be publishing in the next couple of months, so if, if people are interested in finding out more, um, please do get in touch and we'll be happy to share the results of that uh, paper once it's out. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Thank you very much. And next, uh, let's move on to uh, Ziken's presentation. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, can I have my slides up, please? Well, um, I, I come I come today to give a bit of a perspective, right? A slightly different perspective because uh, in in Singapore we we launched our data protection certification mark two years ago, and um, I thought I what I want to do is to um, share how we view uh, certification and um, the role that we see uh, certification play in uh, data protection uh, administration, uh, administration of our data protection law, right? And I, and I want to end off by sharing some thoughts about how we could actually work uh, closer together with industry and other owners of certification systems uh, to promote interoperability, especially for companies that have to operate across multiple jurisdictions. So um, on, on screen, you see now our data protection uh, trust mark, right? Uh, the one on the left, the data protection trust mark is a domestic certification. Uh, it is designed uh, for compliance with our domestic law. And I think that's going to be one of the features that you're going to, you're going to see, which is going to be a, a hallmark of a lot of these certification systems across the world. 
um, whichever uh, country that comes up with it, right, it's going to be domestic and it's going to have a domestic focus. Uh, but I think it is important for us to build the domestic certification system with an eye for cross-border interoperability. And uh, when we did so, uh, we built ours with interoperability of the APEC cross-border privacy rules and the privacy uh, uh, principles for uh, processors, right? But privacy rules and processors, a holistic system, so that it is possible for a company that wants to, to apply and be certified for both the domestic certificate and also the APEC certificates. Next slide, please. The um, since uh, we launched this in, uh, well, it's only been two years. It was uh, ex uh, in January 2019, right, uh, that, we, that we launched this. Uh, we've managed to certify uh, 42 companies. Uh, so um, uh, for, for a, uh, a small uh, economy like Singapore, I, I think that uh, it's, it's got pretty good momentum. And, I, and we do still uh, have a very good pipeline of companies going through certification um, through this system. Next, next slide, please. Um, I asked my, uh, I asked to put up this map, right, to really give us a sense of what it is like uh, across the globe. Uh, for, for many of us who are uh, practicing in this area, uh, we, we will know how fragmented data protection laws and standards are. Uh, um, uh, not uh, that there, there is very little. Um, or it's going to be very difficult for us to uh, move towards a global standards because we need to recognize that uh, data privacy standards vary, uh, vary because of different cultures, vary because of different societies, and vary because uh, there are different histories behind uh, this. And I think uh, uh, it is with that recognition in mind that um, uh, we take the view to, to, to say, perhaps uh, we should work harder, right? Consent, uh, moving away from the, the, the uh, a value-driven approach to uh, data protection, to try and identify um, and agree on the common objectives that all of these laws attempt to. To achieve this, to protect consumers, it is to build trust in the in the ecosystem, tr uh, consumer trust, trust uh, in a well administered um, data protection um, regime and trust in good governance within organizations. And this is where I think that uh, uh, there is a lot of potential, uh, and, that, and there's a lot of work that we can do. And uh, one of the one of the things that um, I will touch on actually uh, has been illustrated by Guy's um, uh, presentation just before this. So I, I think that um, uh, as more countries consider implementing laws, as uh, countries like Singapore and I think um, New Zealand recently and uh, update our laws, right? Uh, we, we need to see how we could work towards greater interoperability uh, because today um, the world is a, is a flat, right? Uh, uh, companies operate ac across multiple jurisdictions and we need to make it, um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say simple, but we need to make it possible. Uh, we need to simplify um, how a company, uh, companies who operate across, across multiple jurisdictions can uh, adopt similar processes and similar uh, systems to achieve uh, interoperability. So, uh, next slide, please. So, um, what what I think uh, we we could do really um, are a few things, right? I think for for um, owners of certification marks, owners owners of certification systems. Uh, we should try to see whether we could uh, build bridges, for example, mutual recognition of, um, of our certification systems to promote um, the ease right, of uh, uh, cross-border trade, uh, flow of uh, cross-border data flows. Uh, when designing, uh, we should look to see whether there are established um, standards that we could just incorporate, refer to, right? Um, and make it a lot easier for uh, companies who are already adhering to those standards to gain the domestic certification. But I think the certification 
really just uh, tr uh, tries to simplify the uh, and uh, tries to people over the, the the fragmentation at the at the higher um, uh, legislative and, and legal uh, legal layer. I think what we could uh, try to do more is really identify products, right? Technology products. Uh, what what guys sometimes refer to as controls, right? Um, uh, controls implemented through uh, solutions that companies can uh, adopt and implement. Uh, and that actually, if certifications um, uh, system, uh, certifications um, standards are able to recognize and uh, accept that certain of these products help to meet certain of the controls and, and uh, meet certain of the requirements, it will actually make it a lot easier, right? Uh, for companies to standardize on a product and, and be able to meet the requirements of multiple certification systems and from and, and, and from that meet the requirements of different uh, uh, legal regimes. But the, the, the um, solutions and, um, and, and controls are only part of the picture. And uh, here I, I want to reinforce what Guy has mentioned, right? Um, you need to wrap it around, right, uh, with good processes. And so this is where we, um, my own view is really to see whether we could also standardize, right? I uh, have examples, template uh, processes um, that, uh, uh, that different certification systems will recognize and will accept, right? And in combination uh, with the technology products or sometimes even on its own, these uh, uh, template processes uh, might be quite sufficient, right? Uh, I mean, And make it a lot easier applications. So, so, uh, so these are some of the thoughts that I thought uh, I would leave uh, with, uh, with with us. And um, I look forward to the question and answer and the discussion uh, after this. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Excellent job keeping with time and also conveying the information you wanted to convey. That was that was very very good. So let's begin with a few um, questions. Uh, also, during this question and answer period, please submit your questions so that we can uh, address them directly from the audience. And then I'll, we'll receive them and I'll, re, I'll replay them or re-speak um, re them out so everyone can hear the questions as they come in. But to begin with, let's begin with uh, Guy. I'd like to ask you a question, Guy. Um, you mentioned synthetic data and differential privacy as privacy controls. What what should we be thinking about in companies if we're considering using these kinds of controls? Right. So, so I think they're both technologies that we've seen a lot of a lot of excitement about in in the last couple of years, and they're both technologies that can again one is really a definition of technology, but they're both uh, things that can that can add a lot of value. I would say both of them are not general solutions, right? So you're not going to solve your privacy problems across an enterprise with either. They're going to be a small, very targeted, specific set of, uh, of use cases where they're applicable. Synthetic data most likely for data discovery and for helping uh, entities understand the kind of shape of data and perhaps uh, development and testing and things like that. Uh, and differential privacy probably for things like when you're publishing data, so when you really have no control of the environment, um, and you're releasing it into uh, yeah, into an unknown space where you don't know what attacks might be there or the motivations might be, and you can't protect the data in any way other than at the data level. Um, so when doing that, I think there's a couple of key things to think about. One, for differential privacy, there's this value epsilon, uh, which really tells you how much someone could learn. And that's the great thing about differential privacy, you can control what is learnable effectively. Um, and so a really important question for that is how how much should that be, right? How do you choose, for what basis are you going to set that value? That's a really important question for anyone wanting to use differential privacy. So you need to have a, a way of reasoning about what an appropriate level of protection is. Um, I think the second with, with synthetic data, there's sort of two sides to it. One, if you if you create really realistic synthetic data with something like GANs, gen, general adversarial uh, networks, then you can actually reconstruct some of the original data sets. So uh, some of the original values. So you need to make sure that you've got a way of protecting against that uh, and have thought about that. And one way of doing that is actually using differential privacy. You can use differential, differentially private synthetic data to block that. Um, and the second question is, how do you know what's true? Right? And this is one of the issues with using synthetic data for analytical purposes, is you don't, if, you've, if you're wanting to do exploratory data science and synthetic data, then you won't know what trends in the synthetic data are actually true of the original data set versus it being created by the randomness of the generation. Um, and so, again, I think that's when choosing when 
to use that technology, you need to think about, well, actually, how am I going to know whether the, the, the signal in that noise is, is, uh, is true or not, uh, and whether that's necessary for my use case. So I think those are the kind of, if you're looking at those technologies, those are the key things you should be uh, focused on. It's a very, very, very good description. Sometimes we in industry uh, get attracted to the shiny objects and uh, think that they're going to solve all of our problems. And differential privacy has become a shiny object. I think yeah. we just put it in the context. Thank you, Dan. Moment. It is great, but for a specific yeah. set of things. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thanks for that, that uh, level setting. Thank you. And I, uh, for Zikin, I'd like to ask you a question now, if that's all right. Um, you had mentioned a few times on interoperable standards, and that is a, a key challenge for multinational corporations on standards and interoperability. Uh, do you believe that the work that uh, Professor Bashir has mentioned in, in consolidating the standard controls and frameworks and displaying them in a uniform way is going to help that objective? Yeah, sorry, I, 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 lost, I lost you for a bit there. Could you repeat the question? Sure, yes. Uh, the the uh, Professor Bashir's work is looking across all standards globally and trying to consolidate them into a common framework and present them and identifying any gaps or inconsistencies across those frameworks in a uniform way. Do you think that'll help your goal as you described as, as interoperability of standards across the globe? Yes, I, I think that um, uh, work uh, in that area definitely will help. I think um, um, as we started our journey in developing our certification system, uh, we studied um, various jurisdictions and we realized that a lot of it had different uh, genesis. Some started from the, the uh, safe, uh, safe surfing, you know, uh, uh, web safe uh, kind of a history and then it, it developed further. Some came from cybersecurity, some, some came from uh, data protection, right? So um, uh, as we converge, I think it is important for us to uh, um, uh, right, it is important work to try and identify the, the, uh, where they are common and where there are gaps. Uh, uh, without this study, we, we don't know what needs fixing, but more importantly, we don't know what is common as well. Uh, the, the, the big challenge is that people who own these certification systems, and, and we ourselves are guilty of that, uh, we, we are focused on our own domestic work, right? Uh, we, we've got, we've got um, uh, uh, our hands busy just getting the next uh, uh, company um, uh, uh, assessed and certified, right? Uh, so we need someone to do that kind of study. And uh, I think that uh, as, uh, I, I think what the, the COVID-19, uh, what, what COVID-19 has shown very clearly is that uh, everyone's going digital and um, uh, that gives us the impetus to make sure that uh, as more uh, companies realize that they have to go online, they are actually operating across multiple uh, uh, markets, across multiple jurisdictions. And this is going to be important moving forward, uh, very important moving forward. And, and I, I definitely will be keen to see how we could collaborate and, and to take the next step, right? Uh, as an owner of a system, right? And as a system uh, that's built for interoperability with APEC, to see what more can be done, right? Uh, especially in the Asia region. Uh, to, to, to make it a lot easier because the easier it is for companies to adopt these uh, um, uh, the templates, uh, processes and common uh, solutions, it's actually better for consumers, better for regulators, right? And it builds trust. So we, we achieve the goal that we are after. So, I, I, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic, right? That uh, with attention paid, uh, into developing this kind of interoperable um, um, standards, or not, not so much standards, but work to promote interoperability, um, uh, uh, we, can, we can start uh, achieving that. Thank you very much. And then since that's the, that may be the a foundation of some of the work that we're talking about here, Professor Bashir, what, what are the next steps that you want to take with the C2P2 framework? What, what do you want to do next with that? Um, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you for the comments that other uh, panelists have made. Um, we're all in agreement in all of these challenges that we're facing, right? Uh, from an academic point of view, of course, we do a good job in um, doing qualitative or quantitative um, systematic scientific research, but the applicability and the real world examples will have to be done by my colleagues here. So um, the next steps are really to, as I mentioned, a lot of the work we've done this past year was uh, qualitative, 
that it was qualitative and we need to really verify a lot of the work we've done now with quantitative methods. We'd like to use machine learning, uh, natural language processing techniques to verify and to uh, improve the C squared, P squared framework that we've come up with. So that's one of the immediate things we're gonna do. We've also been working on uh, developing a taxonomy of privacy, mm -hmm. uh, which I think will be, again, another important step forward in getting us all on the same page because as everybody mentioned in their presentation, there's a lot of variations between what we consider to be privacy, the regional, cultural, language differences that we need to accommodate and understand. And I think perhaps having a taxonomy, at least in the English language, would help us, uh, again, have similar terms that we could use. Because one of the challenges have been in looking through these 10 different frameworks that we've looked at, there's a lot of the similar protections are described in very different ways and terms and language. So uh, it's hard to know, do we mean the same thing or not? So one of the other things we're gonna do is to be developing a taxonomy of privacy in the near future, um, again, for uh, suggestion and for evaluation by the privacy community. Thank you, Dr. Bashir. And that's, that brings us to a, a, a question to the practitioner, Lisa. Uh, how important is that to have normalized privacy terms for implementing privacy in organizations? I think it's so very important because as you're trying to help your people who are not privacy aware today, or even experts at it, but they are have to be the practitioners of actually building in the um, the tools or the software or uh, or operating the system, we need to have consistency for them to be able to know that they are meeting those regulations. But if we have all of these different terminologies, it's very hard for them to have the time or understanding. So anything that we can normalize down to really makes it much easier for us to work uh, across the world. Thank you, Lisa. And I think that's a very good point. And as we mentioned too, that the, the taxonomy is the next step for the research, but uh, what can you do with the current research in this uh, consolidation, uh, consolidation of regulations or uh, uniform framework? How does that help in privacy by design, Lisa? It really helps us in the sense of where we can work through those controls and understand, oh, if I do this one control and be it a new piece of technology or a process, it's going to meet these 15 or 20 or three or one. And now I know that I can check mark that off with my guidance and verification so that we are ready to go and get a certification. We've already got that covered. And if I can get more of them, the better that that technology or process is has more value to us. So it lets me also know how to prioritize that work, right? Yes, yeah, so it also sounds like it, it gets greater value out of the work because you yes. can enter more more markets because of it. Yes, correct. Very good, thank you. And and Guy, I have a question for you next. Um, I know you've been having trouble hearing, but I, can you hear me okay? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, uh, I'll hold the question, he'll come back in, I'm sure. So, uh, Zikin, I had a question for you about this. You mentioned that you're, I'm sure you're quite busy in certifying these different organizations against your, uh, your requirements. How do you go about doing that? What's the process for that? Right, um, well, actually, it's, it's a pretty standard, uh, 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 certification process, right? So, so uh, we 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 develop we develop the certification standards. Uh, uh, what what happens is that uh, we appoint a uh, uh, I think now five. Uh, we appoint we appoint five. Or six. Okay, okay. I'll, Sorry, I'll, 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 yeah, I don't know what <laughs> Samuel? Can you mute? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So so uh, we, we developed the, the certification system. Uh, we have a, a bunch of um, assessment bodies, right? And they actually go down. Uh, they go on site. Um, they, they look. They look for the evidence of the 
um, controls that are available. Um, they, uh, they give us an ass assessment uh, report. Uh, we, we, we review it. We, we want to make sure that it is uh, uh, up to scratch. And then uh, when we are when we are satisfied, we issue it. So it's very, very typical and very, very um, um, pretty standard, right? Uh, how how yes. we run these uh, systems. But very I want good. to pick up a point um, what, what Lisa said, right? Because you see, um, if there is more consistency uh, in the kind of um, um, uh, controls that are put in place, that kind of, uh, if, if let's say um, uh, if within a certain uh, 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 sector, uh, they, they like to use this particular software and uh, and if the software comes with a, a, a template processes that they, they can follow uh, it, if some of these steps are more homogeneous and more, more standardized it actually makes the certification um, easier i would say uh, 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 it, it makes the process a little bit faster right and it gives it gives so I think that one, one of the things that might, uh, I, I hope might develop in future, it may well be that um, solution providers, when they provide a uh, off-the-shelf uh, software, they, uh, especially those that handle large uh, masses of um, uh, personal data, they might actually have certain recommendations on what kind of uh, workflow to adopt that will maximize the investment in the software while at the same time adhering to the uh, a, a good number of um, uh, good practices uh, in compliance of uh, data protection requirements. So, so I think that um, I'm hoping that we'll see more of that and introduce and inject a bit more standardization in this. Very good, thank you. And I, I really like the way you, you, you couched it as balancing between achieving our goals to improving privacy and allowing companies to be able to successfully do that work without having to overburden them and make them more difficult. And that's a really excellent description of the balance. Your goal is to improve privacy. So let's work together to achieve that goal. It's very good. So Guy, I, I think you're back now. And I hope so, yes. the, the one question that I had for you, uh, and I know that you do these uh, analysis of organizations for privacy, um, how do organizations know that they've done enough to be compliant? Well, I think that's that's a, a good question because it's very difficult for organizations. Um, you know, I think especially when you have something like the, the GDPR in Europe, uh, which obviously it's been around for a few years now, but there's still a huge number of areas where guidance doesn't exist. There isn't case law. Uh, there aren't clear public examples. And there's a, there's a nervousness about people saying what they're doing in case they've got it wrong, right? And I think there's a real role um, for trade bodies and, and regulators to, to work together to support uh, data controllers to better understand when they've done enough. And I, I, I think that, as mentioned, I don't think you, I think it's difficult to do across industry because often uh, the, the nature of controls is specific to the use cases and the data sets and, and that's more sort of consistent within an industry than of course. Um, but I think regulators uh, being able to work, being confident to work with people like trades bodies and saying, well, uh, if you have a code of conduct or if you have some uh, statement of what you see as best practice here, uh, we will engage with you on that and work with you on that. And it's not looking to, I mean, really sort of following on in, from Zeke's point in a way, uh, we're not looking to catch you out here. We're looking to collaborate uh, and, and co together develop best practices. And I think to that end, really it's transparency. That, that the best way to know you've done enough is to be able to talk in a, uh, in a comfortable way with peers within your industry and with the regulator about, look, this is what we think makes sense to us. This is what, what, we, what we're doing and this is why. Is that enough? Is that, is that what others are doing? Are there differences? Are there things we can learn from one another? And I think that's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of appetite for that, um, but there needs to be a safe space for doing that. There needs to be an encouragement uh, for that, I think particularly for, for GDPR issues in, in Europe here. Um, uh, in order to get that transparency as a positive feedback cycle that then allows organizations to, to be more transparent, more open, and improve their practice. Very good, thank you. Thank you very much. And a question for Lisa again. Uh, how, the, I know the privacy controls are coming out and the, sometimes they're being updated as well. Uh, how often does that impact engineering? How often does engineering need to update to respond to these changes? 
Um, what we have, it really depends on the area that you're in and the amount of risk that you're taking in that environment. For our environments that are doing things like AIML, you know, we have to be very careful with that, right, Chris? Because, you know, it's an area that may affect with consequential decisions a, a person or a group of people. There are other areas in our market that, you know, the privacy is really being used, private PII is being used for logins and, you know, their, their, their passwords, you know, just to be the administrator of something. So we have to be very aware of just as Guy was saying that it's not one size fits all, but that we have that ability to verify. And what we do with the by design is take the advantage, take advantage of the concept of doing the assessment, somewhat like Guy was saying, and have that safe space at the beginning by design to kind of, to know what we want to accomplish. Mm -hmm and then have that backlog. As changes happen in the regulations, we change our policy, our policy changes, we look at our controls, and then we update the, the guidance and verification of that so that they can see that. And they usually have, because, because regulations usually have some time between the time it comes out and the time it becomes a, a necessary to, to meet it, we can make those changes in our products where it has to be. But it's always being done agilely, and making sure that we're prioritizing where it might harm the people the most. Thank you, Lisa. And since these changes are happening in privacy controls and new ones are coming out, Professor Bashir, what, what do you uh, plan to do as part of your framework uh, to be able to account for those changes? Um, so as Lisa mentioned and other speakers mentioned, I think privacy protections needs to be an iterative design process, right? We're gonna do some things as, as baseline, go back to it, see if it really, if there are any issues or if there are any gaps and then refine it and do a better job and go at it at, at the next level, right? So it is a lot of um, just, uh, I think that's where I think the baseline protection would be really important and essential to develop because we really don't even have this set of basic privacy protections that we can all agree on to say, no matter where you reside, no matter which jurisdiction, what region or what kind of, protections you may or may not have under the law that we as companies or as data holders and data processors should be abiding by. So that's where the baseline protection comes. But I agree that any framework that we develop today and in the next six months, a year, will have to be continuously evaluated and uh, determine whether it's appropriate or more protection needs to be put in. And so that's why I think this a collaboration between industry and academia is really important between researchers and practitioners, I think is really important in the privacy segment because things are gonna change, new technologies are gonna come, new ways of identifying information that we thought was not possible five years ago or last year with AI, um, especially uh, machine learning, a lot of inferences can be made that we need to be thinking about. So I, th I like to think that this is, uh, an area where this just continues to be new developments and hence new privacy violations that could happen. And we have to be thinking about privacy protections on, our, on a continuous basis and reevaluate our protections. Thank you, thank you. And uh, so since these regulations and, and frameworks are changing fairly fluidly and new ones being introduced with specific concerns based on new insights and new information from different countries and different markets, Zikin, how do you think um, interoperability is going to be successful? What do, you, what do you think will have to happen to make that successful? Well, I, I think that um, uh, we're in this phase right now where as more of the data protection legislations get updated, the more they look the same. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, because uh, the GDPR came on the scene, right? Uh, and that, that's, that presents uh, the, the most recent standard. So uh, that's prompted a round of if there are any new uh, initiatives there that's worth adopting. Uh, we did the same thing when we amended our law just a couple of months ago. I, I know that um, uh, that's uh, at, for, for the policymakers, that's the kind of discussion that we have. And I, I think that um, uh, yes, there, there will be uh, more. Um, countries introducing laws and uh, and there will be uh, countries updating their laws but uh, everyone's really trying to uh, make sure that uh, the, the, the new ideas right are incorporated and in, uh, and um, and as they are incorporated into domestic law 
uh, they are adjusted so that it fit the, it, it fits the domestic circumstances. So I, I, it's not a situation where um, uh, because there are new laws coming, it becomes more fragmented. I think that because there are new, new laws coming, uh, we are actually starting to converge. Uh, yeah. My own uh, reservation is whether it is possible to converge into one global standard. And I, I, I did share earlier that because I think that data protection is one thing that's so close to, um, so, so heavily influenced by history, culture and society, you, yeah. you can't have one standard, but you can actually have common enough right, uh, features that it is possible uh, that if we concentrate on the common features, uh, move away from a uh, value-driven um, uh, uh, perspective and just look at the processes and look at the common objectives, I think it is very, very possible to achieve this. Very good. Thank you. Well, we have a little bit more time. I'd like to offer a roundtable, just a quick closing remark from all of our panelists. Let's begin with the last presenter. Uh, Zikin, would you like to offer closing remarks? Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I, would, I would just say that um, um, uh, what I heard on this panel and what we just shared, I think, uh, uh, gives me a lot of optimism because it seems like a, a, a number of us are actually looking at these things in perspective. And uh, we re really want to see how we could work at the ground level uh, to make things easier for companies to adopt and comply with the, the data protection requirements. And in that, uh, in that, in doing that, allow them to comply with multiple uh, laws across multiple markets and jurisdiction, and and achieve that objective that we want to uh, protect consumer uh, data, to build and promote trust. Thank you very much, Mr. Cohen. Would you like to offer a closing remark? Yeah, I, I mean, this, it's been interesting hearing hearing uh, everyone else's presentations and 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 and, and comments. As, and and so I've got a few thoughts. One one really building on on, on what Zeke was saying. Um, that I think in some instances what we may see is global organizations needing to apply a consistent process uh, and defaulting to a certain standard for that. And there will be exceptions, as Zeke mentioned, at, at a national level. But that actually maybe in some countries, what'll, what'll, the main difference might be how they report what they're doing as opposed to the process that they're going to follow. So you might see these processes being fairly consistent for data sharing, for health research, or whatever it might be. Um, uh, I mean, not, not again, with some countries that won't be true, but, but for many jurisdictions that may be true. Um, but the way in which you, you might do your reporting would, would change. Uh, I think um, there's, there's, there's another, another point from some, some of the points made earlier as well, that I think when we, we, this bridging the gap issue, right, which is that we're talking a lot about controls uh, and these controls are changing and plus we're changing the environment, we're deploying them in because of cloud and, and there's, a, there's a variety of moving pieces. And at the same time, you've got these quite high level, necessarily broad principle rights and obligations based laws, which don't give the level of granularity to let organizations know, do, what, what do I actually do in this given situation? And I think so we need these, these tools in the middle, these standards and case stud studies and codes of conduct and things that can help bridge that gap and explain when to use what and, and what it demonstrates and why. Um, and I think we should, there's some sort of strategic considerations around what's the right level to do that at? What's the right uh, balance here? And I think for me, it, it is, it's necessarily industry and jurisdiction. And that's because um, you can't be specific to every organization. There just aren't enough people in the regulators to go through and say, we'll look at your specific setup, every organization and validate that it's okay. And at the same time, guidance that's written too broadly won't be actionable. By, by organizations. And so what are the core things that actually make a difference? Well, many industries have their own specific data laws, particularly in health and finance, where you see additional laws that mean you really do need to consider it at the industry level. And again, the types of data held by industries, obviously that's changing with, with insurance, getting more health data or you know, whoever it may be, the, the, the changing nature of these data sets, but still generally for the kind of 80-20 split, for the majority of what they do in that 80%, um, uh, industries are, are, are similar. And so you're looking at the same kind of uses of data, the same kinds of data, the same kinds of laws. And so you can be much more specific about best practices than you can be at that general level uh, without, and it's also manageable, right? Because you do have representative bodies at that level um, and a regulator can get its arm around, you know, uh, the top 15 industries or whatever, in a way it can't get its arms around the, a million different companies. 
So I think thinking about the right level to intervene is, is, is important. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. And in the last 30 seconds each, oh, sorry. Uh, Lisa, could you offer your closing remarks and then Professor Bashir? Yeah, I just, I think what's most important is that we continue to work together to see the different levels that we need to be taken care of and constantly look for the, the places that were consistent and then provide the ability to be unique where we need to. Thank you. So, Professor Bashir. Sure, yes. Um, so my closing remark is that I'm looking for as much feedback, input, criticism, evaluation of this new framework. Um, so I'm, you know, I would appreciate any and all kinds of feedback, good and bad, about this framework and how we can improve it. Thank you very much. Well, I believe that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, my panelists, for, for sharing such keen insights. And I hope the uh, attendees have a new understanding of the impact of uh, privacy controls and standards on the industry and, and the, their personal data as well. Thank you, Chris. Yes, thank you so much Chris, for moderating. Thank you, and thank you for all the panelists agreeing to be part of this panel. Uh, it's been really great.